archaeologists have found. So uh, uh, it's a book that I, I got in preaching school, and uh, I've appreciated it and uh, absolutely love it. So uh, let's see. Okay, and before we get into uh, into class here, let's. Um, is there anybody we need to remember in prayer? Yes, uh, my wife seek employment, please. Okay, was that uh, Edward? No, Bonnie. Okay, Bonnie. Okay. Yeah, no. Me, um, I'm Veronica. I'm not feeling fine for some time, so I just want to pray, uh, healing for healing. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, Edward, would you uh, lead us in a prayer as we begin, please? Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you this night for being a good God unto us. Sometimes we, we look back and see the good things, Lord, which you have done to us. Some of them, Lord, we don't even deserve them. But you being a good God to us, you have actually restored them unto us. We thank you and we appreciate you. Even tonight, as we come to study your word, we pray that you be with us. We pray that you open our minds so that we may understand scriptures. And that, Lord, we may try and pattern our lives in accordance to your word. Thank you, Father, for this day. And thank you for everything that we are going to do today. We also remember our brothers and sisters, Lord, in different places, who are in different uh, predicament. Lord, I remember even uh, uh, Brother Bani's wife, which, which is looking for employment. I pray that, Lord, you be with her. I pray that, Lord, you will provide employment for her. I even put before you tonight, Lord, Sister Veronica, who oh, she's not feeling well. Lord, I pray that you be with her. I pray that, Lord, you touch her in Jesus' mighty name. Father, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. So the uh, the quiz, any surprises there? <laughs> no, no surprising. <laughs> Everything was fine. <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. Because uh, if you're surprised, that means I, I did not I failed and I did not teach like I should have. No. <laughs> um, so as we talked last uh, last class period. Uh, we talked some about the uh, uh, the moral justification uh, for the uh, for God giving the land to the Israelites. We talked about the uh, the promises that He had made, and uh, we talked some about Joshua and the preparation for him uh, as uh, as he. Uh, prepared to become uh, the leader of the people. And I'd like to spend just a little bit more time with Joshua and then get into uh, the book of Joshua. And here uh, in the book of Numbers, chapter 34, and if we look chronologically at uh, uh, the book of, of Numbers, that takes up most of the wilderness wanderings. And the book of Deuteronomy uh, covers a period of about 30 days. Uh, 
uh, right there at the end of Moses's time. And by the end of Deuteronomy, Moses has passed away. So Numbers gives us that uh, uh, most of that history. And that's why I've been uh, spending a bit of time there. And here toward the, uh, the end of uh, the book of Numbers in chapter 34, verse 17, these are the names of the men who shall divide the land among you as an inheritance, Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun. So Eleazar was the high priest. He was one of Aaron's sons. Uh, and such, he was eligible uh, to be a priest. And uh, so we had the two men that were doing the dividing. Uh, and as we get into the details, it appears that uh, Joshua was uh, the one who really was the spokesperson, the one who was uh, making the announcements. Uh, but God had Eliezer, uh, who was a part of that process uh, as well. Then in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 38, Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall go in there uh, into the promised land. This is God speaking to Moses. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. So as we look at the, at the book of Deuteronomy, that is the 30 days prior to them uh, uh, going into the land. And part of that is preparation of Joshua that there in the book of Deuteronomy, there's quite a bit of retelling of the law and restating it uh, to make sure that everybody understands, especially Joshua, as he gets prepared uh, to lead the people. So uh, uh, that's what that's what we have leading up to it. And we get to the end of the book of De Deuteronomy. Chapter 31. Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, be strong and of good courage, for you must go with his people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. Uh, a very similar statement uh, to what he said. Um, back at the beginning of the book, in the first chapter, uh, that passage that I that that phrase that I have highlighted there, be strong and of good courage. That's something that was continually said to Joshua, and it's something that Joshua told others. If anything, it was uh, a rallying cry of the Israelites. Uh, don't know if. Uh, Joshua had some uh, with some hesitancies in taking over the leadership of the people. He had obviously been very well prepared. I don't know if he was afraid of leadership, uh, but we see this phrase used continually. And then Joshua himself uses it as well. Uh, so exactly why it's there so many times, we don't know. But it is, and uh, a, a good phrase it is. Then just a few verses later, verse 23, Then he, being Moses, inaugurated Joshua the son of Nun and said, Be strong and of good courage. There's that phrase again. For you shall bring the children of Israel into the land which I swore to them, and I will be with you. Excuse me, that's God speaking with him. Uh, there in verse verse 23. So again, that be, be strong and of good courage. We see that refrain time and time again. And then chapter 34, verse 9. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands on him. So the children of Israel heeded him and did as the Lord had commanded Moses. So here we see the, uh, the handing off of uh, of the role of leader of the people from Moses to uh, to Joshua. And then we get to the book of Joshua, uh, and we have that restrate, restated for us as well. Um, that, uh, whoops. Uh, 
the passing on the uh, the torch, so to speak, from uh, from Moses to Joshua. As we get into the book of Joshua, let's let's begin with the first uh, first nine verses here. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. There's that phrase again. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. There's that phrase again. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So here we have uh, God speaking to Moses. And here in verse number one, that phrase, the servant of the Lord, uh, is applied to Moses. Uh, that That is a very rarely used phrase in Scripture. And yet 40 to, 41 times it describes Moses. And that helps us to understand just how uh, significant uh, Moses was. Uh, Moses being... Um, uh, having a relationship with God closer than anyone else, save Jesus. You know, with everybody else, he spoke in visions. Moses, he had that those conversations face to face. And again, we don't know how close Joshua was in those things, but uh, Joshua indeed is uh, is a part of that. Verse number two. Now, uh, remember, Moses uh, went up to Mount Nebo, was able to see the promised land, and there he died by himself, and God buried him. Uh, so this is really what we have in verse two, the announcement uh, that Moses has has died. Joshua was finding that out. Uh and he tells them, okay, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I'm giving you. So uh, with Moses' passing, it's this is now time for Joshua to step up, uh, to take that role. And, and as we look to, uh, to make application for this ourselves, we need to be ready to step up. We need to be ready at any point in time uh, to be that person. Uh, who fills the role uh, that that needs to be filled. And, you know, as we look at Joshua and, and these verses here, some of the things the Lord is telling him uh, for those desiring to be uh, elders and deacons in the Lord's church, preachers in the Lord's church, teachers in the Lord's church, uh, those God-given roles He's giving us an understanding what it takes to fulfill those roles. And uh, so as, as we look at Joshua, we're not just looking at this as trivial history, 
but we're trying to understand and make application to it ourselves. Uh, verse number three, kind of interesting the way the phraseology is here. The people had not yet even stepped foot uh, across the Jordan. Yet God says in verse three, I have already given to you is is the sense of uh, uh of the tense of those verbs it's already been done though they haven't done a single thing so uh what's got what's god is saying by using this tense of the verb uh i've already done my part everything i have to do i i have done now it's up to joshua and the people to do their part to to make this happen you know this this promise here is still conditional upon their obedience uh you know as he talks about this this you know there's there's still things that they need to do and they need to carry those out faithfully but as long as they do those things the land will be theirs uh, we also see that in, in chapter 6, verse 2, uh, when the Lord, before they begin to take Jericho, he said, I have already given you Jericho, uh, though they hadn't at that point marched around the city a single time. So we see that phraseology being used, uh, and that means God's already done his part uh, so that the people can uh, can do their part. Verse number four, he gives the reaches of the territory, uh, you know, as, as far as the river Euphrates, uh, that's also called the Great River. Uh, the Great Sea would be the Mediterranean Sea, which was to the west uh, of them. So that would be toward the going down of the sun. Uh, and the these boundaries he's given, the, the nation of Israel going all the way to the Euphrates, uh, that didn't happen. Uh, you know, Saul brought the boundary to the Euphrates. It was David who conquered Jerusalem. You know, there were still Jebusites that were living there. Uh, David conquered that. And the totality of covering all the territory was accomplished during the reign of Solomon. So we have quite a period of time here. Uh roughly four to five hundred years before these outer reaches of the the kingdom would indeed happen uh, but God's saying here hey I've I've already given this to you verse number five no man shall be able to stand before you uh that stand before you is a, a Hebrew idiom uh also called a Hebraism um that nobody would be able to resist you. Uh, and why is that? Well, because God is the one who's fighting this battle. Uh, and, and by the time we finish up class today, we'll see that uh, that indeed is the case. And our relationship with him, him fighting our battles, rests upon our faithfulness to him. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. And as we look at these reassurances here, beginning in verse 5, uh, you know, as, as we look at ourselves and our leadership roles as elders, deacons, preachers, and teachers, uh, these things hold with us as well. You know, when we're uh, we're trying to teach somebody else the gospel, is God with us as we're teaching them? We're striving to do his will. We're faithful to him. Absolutely. Uh, he for us. Verse six here, this be strong and of good courage. Uh, we see that multiple, multiple times here. And, and that's something that um, Joshua, uh, like I said, Joshua may, may have needed to hear it. 
uh, or it may have just been a rallying cry for them. Um, but regardless, uh, with that phrase, there's great application to us. Uh, as, as we look uh, into our roles, that we need to be strong, we need to be courageous. As a preacher, are there some things that the people don't want to hear from time to time? Yes, that happens. Truths that people need to hear, but they don't want to hear. What does the faithful preacher of God need to do? He needs to preach it anyways. Amen? Amen. And, and with that, I'm not saying that uh, uh, that you have to shove it down their throats at every opportunity. But we cannot shun uh, to preach the whole counsel of God. Uh, Acts chapter 20, when, when Paul is uh, meeting with the Ephesian elders there at Miletus, he tells them, uh, Acts 20, verse 20, I kept back nothing that was helpful. Uh, he preached the whole counsel of God. Uh, the whole time he was there. And uh, verse 26, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I've done my part, um, is, is what he's saying there. And as we look at that as Preachers, we can't be afraid. Uh, oh, somebody may not like to hear God's teaching on uh, divorce and remarriage. And they may threaten me. If you preach that here, we're going to fire you. Well, who, who am I going to obey? We need to hear these words that God gave to Joshua. Be strong and of good courage. If we're doing his will, if we're preaching the whole counsel of God, God will be with us. As we look at the role of elders in the church, shepherds, stewards of the souls that have been entrusted to them by God, They've got decisions to make for the good of the congregation. And they need to have the attitude, we're going to do the right thing. We're going to obey God. Period. Having been in some of these discussions, sometimes there's, well, if we do that, then people might leave the congregation or this might happen, or that might happen. But it comes back, if this is something that God commands, guess what, brethren? We don't have a choice. Be strong and of good courage. Do what he said to do. And let the chips fall where they may, uh, if you understand that, uh, that expression. Let the consequences happen. But as for... You, you be faithful. Do exactly what God set out and commanded you to do. So there is a great application there in that phrase. Be strong and of good courage. Verse number seven. Observe to, to, uh, observe to do according to all the law. Every part of it. You know, Jesus said in, in Matthew 23, verse 23, uh, he was pretty uh, pretty direct and straightforward uh, with, the, uh, with the Pharisees there. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. 
doing all the law. Now, was Jesus condemning them for, for tithing their spices? You know, that seems kind of like a, a pretty extreme example, going into the spice cabinet and pulling a tenth out of each one of those spices. But he said, no, no, those you ought to have done. That's a good thing that they did. Obedience to the law to that degree. But they shouldn't have left the weightier matters undone. You see, they did some of the law, but not all of the law. Therein is, is the problem. And that's what uh, God is warning Joshua here in verse number seven. Do it all. Christianity is not a pick and choose uh, what we want to do, what we don't want to do. And don't we see that happening time and time again with the Israelites? Uh, throughout the wanderings uh, and what we've uh, studied up to this point, they wanted to do what they wanted to do and not what God commanded to do. Let me ask you a question and think about this. You know, when, uh, when we're obeying God because we agree with him, and I'll just uh, pick something out. You know, don't beat your wife, or women don't beat your husband. I would hope that's a pretty easy law for us to obey. It, it just it, it makes sense. We we all agree with that. That's not something we should do. Um, uh, that's not where I'll be. Our obedience is tested. What about things that are difficult, things that are hard to obey? Are we just as obedient then? You know, and, and when the Lord says to assemble on the first day of the week, there are some that's burdensome to them. They don't want to do that. Are they truly obedient? Well, I'll obey these commands, but not that command. I'll obey, uh, you know, partake of the Lord's Supper. Yeah, that sounds good to me, but I don't like the way God commanded uh, us to, uh, to sing. I want to add instrumental music to it. So I'm going to do it that way. You see, that's not obedience. And, and people sometimes trick themselves into thinking that they're obedient because they're following a bunch of the commands of God. But as soon as they disagree with God, they stop obeying. That's not real obedience. It's just agreement. Uh, do you see, see the point I'm trying to make here? So we need to make sure that we do all of the law, not just pieces and parts. Uh and take care of everything. Okay. How do you follow um, the command of chapter 1, verse 7? How is it that we follow that? To do everything that he commands us. The way we do that is, okay, so my grandson wants to sit in for a little while. Uh, the way we do that is by obeying the book of the law, going back to the scriptures. How do we know what God's will is for us? We go back to the book. How do we know what his commands are? We've got to go to the book and do that to observe the things that he's commanded us to do. Verse number nine, have I not commanded you? Uh, that, that's what we sometimes would call a, a dummy question. 
Have I not commanded you, dummy? Uh, you know, this, this is obvious. Because this is what I've commanded you to do, I have given you what you need to accomplish it. Uh, and again, there's great application for us in that. When God commands us to do something, he's given us what we need to accomplish that thing. For instance, with evangelism. I mean, we're just a few Christians. The country, South Africa, and even the continent of Africa is huge. How are we going to evangelize that whole area? And sometimes people get overwhelmed because the task is so big. But we need to be confident and, and hold fast to the fact that God is bigger. If he's given us something that we need to do, he's given us what we need to be able to do it. And, and here, verse number nine, we see that uh, that being the case uh, here completely. And he also says here in verse 9, do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. Afraid, don't allow fear to keep you from doing what you've been told to do. And this idea of being dismayed, uh, that would be an emotional coil, that would be a depression from having to do difficult work. That, that's when your spirits get down. So don't do that. Why? Have I not commanded you? Have I not told you to do this and given you everything it takes to get it done? So you can do this. And, and we see this uh, with Joshua here at the beginning uh, of his time in these just first few verses that God is uh, indeed preparing him uh, to do what it is he needs to do. Any questions so far? Uh, comments? Uh, Brother, Brother Tisky? Yes, sir. Uh, there's a verse uh, that uh, needs to be mentioned as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it is found in Second Peter 1, verse 12, and it reads, Therefore, I remind you, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. That yeah, is, uh, that is worse. Excellent thought there. And, and that's... Uh applying to us as well very clearly there in uh, uh in Peter's epistle any other thoughts comments questions yes sir my, my name is a, it's a comment especially on the transition of uh uh Joshua I mean from Moses to Joshua I, I noticed something that uh Moses might have trained Joshua while he was still alive. Like according to scripture, he, uh, he was a, uh, he was a main, he was a, 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 somebody who was helping Moses. Joshua was helping Moses while Moses was still alive. So I want to believe that he, he saw Moses at work, and uh, maybe Moses might have imparted some other leadership skills on the young man. So my 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 comment is on, on on transitioning of leadership. You need to transition. I mean, you need to hand over leadership. And when you hand over leadership, train those not before before you die or before you leave the the, the the post. You rather train the people. Not wait for the last minute for you to die. Then you leave a big void, which it be difficult to to, to fill in. 
absolutely excellent excellent point there and uh you know when we look at the uh at the qualifications for a deacon uh in first timothy chapter three those men are to be tested and if you're not transitioning if you're not giving them a little bit of responsibility how can you test them uh your point exactly and and we see that happening here uh excellent excellent point that we always need to be focused on raising up uh the next generation of leaders be they elders deacons preachers or bible class teachers excellent excellent point brother Moses, that. Is yes, another, um, there's something else that i observed that was never mentioned in my lifetime i might be wrong but when you look at the burial of Moses, it's, it's mm -hmm. very significant. And you look at the burial of Christ. God buried Moses and human beings buried Christ. Basically, human be beings buried God. So that's a big contrast that I've uh, that just came to mind now. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody could find Moses' grave because God buried him. But at least we know that the way Christ was buried, uh, basically it's God in the flesh. That is the significance about the burial. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, some speculation has been the reason that God buried Moses, nobody knew where he was, uh, was so that they could not... Uh, memorialize him unnecessarily in a physical way uh, and we see people uh today some people you know oh they think uh for instance the shroud of turin was what jesus was buried in a and people basically uh see that icon and and uh go as far as to worship it or statues uh and and taking things too far uh we see that happen time and time again uh, and that's not according to God's pattern. Good thoughts, guys. Appreciate that uh, very much. Starting in verse 10, here we have uh, God's command uh, being carried out. Joshua now getting to work. Starting in verse 10. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half the tribe of Manasseh, Joshua spoke, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of the Jordan. But you shall pass before your brethren armed, all your mighty men of valor, and help them, until the Lord has given your brethren rest, as he gave you, and they also have taken possession of the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it which Moses the Lord's servant gave you on this side of the Jordan toward the sunrise. So they answered Joshua, saying, All that you command us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words in all that you command him, shall be put to death only be strong and of good courage so here once again we see that phrase being used at the end of this passage uh joshua be strong and courageous so we see joshua uh commanding the officers he's delegating uh that authority and uh immediately begins preparing the, the people that immediate obedience he didn't have to stop didn't have to think he got right right to business uh as he needed to 
then we have this reminder from verses 12 uh, through verse 15 to those Transjordanian tribes, uh, Transjordanian drive, tribes that they had uh, uh, had their responsibility that they had. Um, we're going to see here in a little bit uh, that about 40,000 of Reuben, Gad, and half tribe of Manasseh, 40,000 soldiers crossed over the Jordan, which was about half of the men. Uh, the others stayed back with the women and the children in the cities uh, to defend them uh, against anybody else coming in and most likely to uh, to farm and do things like that to take care of uh, take care of the people. So we have uh, the men of valor, as they're referred to, who do make this trek over and uh, uh, they do so faithfully and they promise their complete obedience and, and one thing that we will see here uh these two and a half tribes uh throughout the book of joshua are faithful you know here they're making pretty good promises if anybody does doesn't obey commands we're going to kill them we will be faithful to a man uh, and indeed, throughout uh, the entire conquest, they are. Uh, and we see here as well um, that they we will obey you, Joshua, the one that God put over us. We will be obedient to you. And uh, that's an interesting point and one that has applicability to us today. Uh, Hebrews 13, verse 17, who has God entrusted uh, to be stewards of our souls? That would be the elders in the congregation. They have a God-given responsibility and God-given authority. Now, their authority is not to change God's laws, but to implement God's laws, continually looking out for the souls of the flock. That, that is their God-given role. And Hebrews 13, 17 tells us very clearly, we are to obey and to be in submission to that authority. So when we're serving under godly elders, we have that same responsibility that these people had to Joshua. Joshua couldn't change God's commands. He implemented God's commands. And the people were bound to that. That same uh, hierarchy, that same process holds true when it comes to elders in the Lord's church. And, and I realize uh, in the Western Cape, there's not many congregations that have elders. And that is a shame uh, because that's God's pattern. And, and we all need to commit ourselves uh, to rise up, to, to grow godly elders within congregations. Uh, Somerset West is blessed in that they have an eldership as as God commanded. Uh, but too many congregations uh, are floundering around uh, without it. And we need to make sure that uh, uh, we're doing everything we can to stop that from continuing. So here in chapter one, God speaks to Joshua, gives him the commands. And then here at the end of the chapter, uh, Joshua delegates authority and starts to get the people moving. And uh, we get into chapter two. And we have the situation with uh, with Rahab and the spies. He's going to send some more uh, uh, some more spies into the land. You know, Joshua and Caleb were the only two of the 12 faithful spies. 
Now they're just sending two into the land uh, to go check out uh, Jericho. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. Uh, so what we have, uh, this Acacia Grove, this is the camp where the people are uh, on one side of the Jordan. When they cross over the Jordan, they're going to make camp at Gilgal, just right across the river. Uh, so these are the two uh, uh, the two places that are home base here uh, for a period of time. But Acacia Grove is where they are across the river. So they're sending two spies over there into uh, uh, across the river in into uh, into Jericho. So they went, came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there, and was told the king of Jericho, saying, "Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country." So the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, uh, excuse me. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut, when it was dark, that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly for you may overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to Jordan, to the fords. And as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. So here we have uh, the first seven verses. We have uh, the spies going in and spending time uh, at Rahab's house. Rahab being a harlot. Uh, and, and some have questioned, you know, what is what what do these uh ha have these men sinned in going to a harlot's house uh in what they've done? And I've heard this before using 1 Thessalonians 5:22 as an argument. Does anybody know what that 1 Thessalonians 5:22 says? Abstain from every form of evil, or the old King James, abstain from uh, all appearance of evil. And people would say, well, going to a harlot's house, doesn't that appear to be evil? Uh, and they misapply that, uh, that verse and, and abuse it. To put it in its proper context, you have to go to the back, previous verse as well. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove or test all things. And once you've tested, there's one of two options. Hold fast to that which is good. If it's not good, if it's evil, abstain from it. That's the point he's making there. This, this every appearance of evil, oh, if it appears evil, that's not what he's saying there. Uh, have they sinned in what they've done? No, they haven't. They haven't done any sin here. Uh, they've been doing what they were set out to do uh, and, and did it faithfully. So verse number two, we see the presence of the spies there in Jericho somehow uh, became known to the king. Don't know how that happened. Uh, but it did. So uh, they were found out. And then uh, somehow they also know that uh, they had visited Rahab. And uh, this appears to be they came to visit Rahab uh, is what the people are thinking in a professional sort of way. Trying to be delicate here. Uh 
came came to visit the harlot uh, for inappropriate reasons. That seems to be what uh, what the people are thinking, and uh, Rahab utilizes that and tells a story. She hid them and then turned around and lied about it. Which leads to a question, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. Hebrews 11, that faith's hall of fame. People being praised for their faithfulness. And who shows up in verse number 31? By faith, the, Rahab, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. So here she is being praised. What has she done? She hid the spies and she lied about it. Is that, are, are those praiseworthy actions? Or are those sin? I think it's actions, nothing to do with sin, brother of Mark. Absolutely, they are sin. To to lie is to sin. So, uh, is the Hebrew writer condoning her sin? And the answer to that question is no. Uh, he is not. When we understand Hebrews chapter 11, what the Hebrew writer is doing there is trying to show and give examples of what true faith is. Faith is something that God has always required. And Hebrews 11 shows it's not a New Testament-only concept. It's something that's been there all along. And uh, if you're somebody who marks in your Bible, go ahead and turn over uh, to Hebrews chapter 11. You, you may want to put some cross-references there, you know, as we're in Joshua 2 to Hebrews eleven thirty one. But here, here in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, this type of, of construction we have here is uh, what's called a chiasm. Key being uh, the Greek letter that looks like an X that we would have in English. And uh, the idea is you're doing something similar before and after. Notice verses 13 through 16. You know, we have this discussion of faith. And he talks about Abraham and Sarah. Then he has this little divergent, verses 13 to 16. And then verse 17, he comes back to Abraham. So we have this kind of sandwich there in the middle. And with the, the chiastic, the chiasm structure, that is the main point. That's that's what it, the point he's trying to make. So what he's, uh, and, and this is what he's trying to do by giving this list of people. Verse 13, these being all these examples he has given and will give, all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. And Rahab had seen what God had done for Israel, and we'll see her verbalizing that here in just a little bit. But she knew exactly what was going to happen to Jericho, her belief was so strong that it led to action. Isn't that what faith is? James chapter 2, faith without works is dead. You know, even the, the demons believe and tremble, but they're not obedient. They don't act consistent with that belief. And she was desiring something better, which was to keep living uh, and not be killed in the slaughter that she knew was coming. 
So does Hebrews 11.31 mean that God condones Rahab's harlotry? No. Does it uh, condone her lying? No. It condones the fact that she knew God's promise to them, and she did something about it. Does It's not making a judgment on whether or not that was righteous, just that it happened. Verses 5 through 7, uh, she turns around and sends uh, the soldiers from Jericho on a, what we would call a wild goose chase. Is that a phrase that you all use? That's wild right. Goose chase? Uh, send them the, the wrong way, uh, sort of. Yeah, send them the wrong way. Uh, if you have ever tried to chase a goose or, or chase a chicken, they're running all over the place, and, and they don't head necessarily in one direction. So she's uh, sending the folks from Jericho uh, to look in the wrong direction for uh, for the spies. Then we come back, uh, beginning in verse number, uh, verse 8. We have this conversation between Rahab and the spies. Now, before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. So here we have uh, her statement of faith. That this is this is exactly what she's thinking and why she is helping out these spies. Because we know the miracles that were done proved that God was with them. And isn't that the purpose of miracles? You know, when you get to uh, to Mark 16, verses 17, uh, through the end of the chapter, we see the purpose of miracles, that people will know you're from God. That's exactly what Nicodemus said, uh, beginning of John chapter 3. When he came to Jesus by night, he said, Lord, we, teacher, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do the things you do unless God is with him. That's the whole purpose of miracles. And Rahab got it. Interestingly, she refers back to uh, the crossing of the Red Sea 40 years earlier. The people heard of that, and they were faint-hearted. When the 12 spies came shortly after that, the people in Canaan had heard about that and they were already afraid of the Israelites so the uh the 10 unfaithful spies they were afraid of something that wasn't real they allowed their fear to get in the way of good judgment and they didn't know that these people were already disheartened and then she refers to the utter destruction of Sihon and Og. This had happened just uh, recently before they crossed, uh, the, before this had happened. And they, utter, they were utterly destroyed. Utterly destroyed. Show no mercy. Uh, and... She knew that could very well be the case, and the people knew. Verse 
So she has no doubt that they're going to uh, utterly defeat Jericho. At the end of verse number 11, uh, she makes the statement, the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. To us today, that sounds like a, a uh, pretty obvious statement. But that was pretty groundbreaking for a Canaanite to say. Because they believed in localized deities. That, okay, the god of uh, Baal is our god. The god of Molech is our god. Uh, and different groups had their different local deities. That they said, okay, this deity has jurisdiction over this area. That's not what Rahab's saying here. He said, no, no. The Lord Jehovah, the uh, the Jehovah, the, the Yahweh, your God, he is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. He is a universal God. He's over all things. So he not only has authority over just your nation, but these actions have proved he is over all the nations. That was not their understanding of deity in Canaan. So kind of an earth-shattering statement she makes, uh, but it's right on. She's got this figured out. She's taken the evidence that was provided to her and came to the realization, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, this covers uh, covers everybody. Then we get verse 14. The spies answered her, Our lives for yours, if none of you tell this business of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land, that we will deal kindly and truly with you. So the, the spies agreed that, yes, you are nice to us. We will take care of you. So the escape plan that they have here, verses 15 and 16, that she let them down by a rope through their window, for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall. And she said to them, get to the mountain, lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterward, you may go your way. So she gives them advice how long they need to be away, how long they will keep searching, uh, and when they're going to give up and come back. Uh, being the uh, the pursuers from Jericho. So uh, she's letting, it, letting them down, letting them escape, and giving them a good plan. Then we have uh, verses 17 through 20, uh, actually through verse 21, is seemingly out of chronological order. Because this is a conversation they have before she let them down, verses 15 and 16. Uh, but just the way it was recorded for us uh, was not necessarily uh, strictly chronological, uh, keeping keeping with the themes. Uh, and we see that some in the, uh, in the New Testament as well, in some of the gospel accounts. Uh, and as you're trying to establish chronology... Uh, you know, sometimes there's an account of something that we'll see in Jesus' life that uh, will begin with, then he did this, the next day he did that, uh, giving us that chronology. Other times, it's just introduced by, well, Jesus did this, Jesus did that, Jesus did something else. Where one is trying to give us the chronology, the other one is not... Uh, not specifically giving us the chronology, just saying he did these things. Uh, so we have that going on here as well. So don't uh, allow that to trip you up. Verse 17. So the men said to her, we will be blameless of this oath of yours, which you have made us swear, unless when we come into the land, you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window 
through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your own home, so it shall be that whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we'll be free from your oath, which you made us swear. Then she said, according to your word, so be it. And she sent them away and they departed. And she bound the scarlet cord in the window. So here's the uh, the agreement. The details is uh, uh, she has to keep quiet. And as long as that scarlet cord is there, anybody who's in the house uh, is taken care of. And, uh, and will be spared. And indeed, that uh, that was the case. So the uh, the spies, verse twenty two, departed, went to the mountain, stayed there three days. Uh, the pursuers returned, and then the two men returned, descended from the mountain, crossed over, came to Joshua the son of Nun, told him all that had befallen them, and they said to Joshua, "Truly, the Lord has delivered all the land into our hands, for indeed all the inhabitants of the country are faint hearted because of us." So here we have a faithful report, like Joshua and Caleb gave, uh, as opposed to the report of the ten unfaithful spies. Okay. Pressing on, chapter 3. We get Israel across the Jordan. Then Joshua rose early in the morning. They set out from Acacia Grove and came to the Jordan, he and all the children of Israel, and lodged there before they crossed over. So it was after three days that the officers went through the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. So we have the plan that's laid forth here, uh, how they're going to get across the Jordan. And we have the uh, uh, the Levites and the priests who are going to go with the Ark of the Covenant, and everybody else is staying back 2,000 cubits. Uh, and that would be... Uh, uh, roughly a thousand meters, give or take, uh, just to give you an idea. So it's quite a distance. Now we have here, uh, the children of Israel uh, are numbered in the millions, but by the ark being so far ahead, everybody would be able to see and see the, uh, have a chance to see what was happening with the ark. And that was, uh, the ark was symbolic of God's presence uh, among the people. Numbers chapter 4, verse 15 tells us that those, uh, one of the three families, uh, three major families in the tribe of Levi, the Kohathites, they were the ones specifically assigned with carrying uh, the items of the temple, including the Ark of the Covenant. Numbers chapter 4, verse 15. Uh, and interestingly, the priest would actually prepare the items for travel put the uh, the rods in uh, so the Kohathites could lift them, uh, and they would use those uh, those rods to carry it, uh, and the Kohathites could not touch those items. The priests were the only ones allowed to do the touching. Uh, the Kohathites were to carry it without touching it at all. Uh, so that's, uh, that's how the, the Ark would move. And we have uh, the people... Again, given these instructions to uh, prepare to go. Verse 5, Joshua said to the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Then Joshua spoke to the, spoke to the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross over before the people. Uh, so he's beginning this process of obedience. Sanctify yourselves. Make yourself holy. Uh, that idea of holy uh, we see that repeated time and time again in the book of Leviticus. Uh, separate yourself uh, for a particular purpose. 
and the uh, the illustration that helps me uh, communicate holiness, I think, better than anything. Uh, do you have at your home at your home uh, maybe some dishes uh, that you use only for holidays and special occasions? Uh, it's a parties and the uh, parties, things like that. Uh, now, do do those dishes change the molecular structure of the food and make it different? Of course not. But they are set aside for a particular purpose. This is uh, a celebration of some sort when we bring out the, the fine china, we bring out the fine dishes. That's the idea of make yourselves holy. Uh, that setting yourselves apart. Okay, I need to approach this differently this is a particular purpose uh that we're doing here likewise we need to make ourselves holy and prepare to serve god so uh the priest and the levites took up the ark of the covenant went before the people and the lord said to joshua verse 7 this day i will begin to exalt you in the sight of all israel that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. You shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you have come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. find it kind of interesting that God continually exalted Moses, made sure the people understood. Uh, you know, when he goes up on Mount Sinai, there's Moses. When he goes in the tabernacle of meeting, there's Moses. He is the leader. No question about it. Yet Numbers chapter 12, Aaron and Miriam, they challenge Moses. Chapter 16, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they challenge Moses. These people continually challenging uh, the leader that God has laid forth. So here in verse 7, we have God saying, I will exalt you. Uh, and when uh, Joshua said back in verse 5, the Lord will do wonders. Okay, there's going to be some miracles happening here, which also points to the fact that God has ordained Joshua to be the leader. And just like miracles were done in Moses' day, miracles being done in Joshua's day, verifying that fact, making sure there's no doubt whatsoever. Uh, this is exactly who God wants in charge. Verse number nine. So Joshua said to the children of Israel, come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, by this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will, without fail, drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take yourselves, take for yourselves 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one man from every tribe, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, the waters that come down from upstream, and they shall stand as a heap. So here in Joshua telling the people what's going to be coming, he, he lays forth the plan. He calls the Lord the Lord of all the earth. Uh, again, showing that God is just not a regional deity, but he is the God of everything. And we have this miracle. As soon as the priest's feet hit the water, the Jordan's going to heap up and... Uh, the waters will be heaped up, and uh, they'll pass through on dry land. Uh, something miraculous that happened, very similar to uh, what happened when they crossed the Red Sea. A little different. This is a river. That was a sea. Uh, and and the river. Uh, here, uh, the similarities, crossing through water, and the fact that uh, as they did so, they crossed on dry land. Verses 14 through 17, uh, we have the details of them crossing over. Uh, and uh, rather than reading that, 
I know our time's uh, starting to run a little short. This happened during the flood season. So we have uh, the waters being high uh, when it would have been without a miracle impossible to get through. But we have uh, the waters being stopped. Uh, and he gives the bounds of this. It was about 15 miles of river that was cut off. And realize that we have, uh, depending on, on how you reckon, uh, between three and six million people here uh, that are part of the Israelites that are crossing over. Uh, so they would need quite a bit of, uh, of territory. It wasn't like they were going in two by two. Uh, this would have been waves and waves of people passing through. Uh, he mentions the Sea of Araba. Uh, that would be also, he calls it the Salt Sea. That's that's what we refer to today as the Dead Sea. So uh, the, peop the, the priest stood there and the people just passed by and the water they were, the ground that they were walking on was solid. Uh, I don't know if you've ever uh, seen a riverbed, but the silt is... Uh, uh, tends to be just a mucky mess and uh, difficult to get through. But that's not the case that we have here. Uh, miraculously, this was, uh, was dried up. Into chapter 4. So when the people had completely crossed over the Jordan, these 12 men, uh, one from every tribe, here's what that was about. Uh, they would take 12 stones from here, from the middle of the Jordan, from where the priests were standing, carry them over, and leave them uh, where they were going to stay that night, which would be over at Gilgal. Uh, so these were memorial stones that they were taking uh, to be with them. Uh, again, uh, as a memorial. Verses 4 through 7, Joshua called the 12 men he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of the Jordan. Each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it crossed over the Jordan, and the waters of the Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be a, for a memorial to the children of Israel forever. So why are they bringing the stones? So they can teach their children as a way of remembering what happened. Uh, and, and we see uh, throughout our lives what, what I refer to as teaching moments, things that we experience that are good lessons to pass on to uh to other generations. Uh, sadly, even though God ordained this, very quickly, their memory was short. After Joshua and all the elders who lived during the time of Joshua died, there rose up a generation that did not know God. They've forgotten all this. We read that in Judges 2, verses 7 through 10. Verse 8, okay, the obedience of the men. And there is some repetition to this, that uh, God tells Joshua what to do. Joshua tells the people to, what to do. And then we have the account of they did what they were told to do. Uh, and that's kind of typical for Hebrew literature, that we have that repetition. Verse number nine, we have 12 additional stones. Then Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan. So this is in the middle of the ri river. Joshua is putting those stones there in the place where the feet of the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there to this day. So they were there as the book was being written, uh, penned by Joshua. Those stones were still there uh, that we have. And then we have uh, uh, through verse uh, 14, we have uh, again, talk of the Transjordanic tribes, 
Uh, Reuben, Gad, half tribe of Manasseh, they crossed over. Verse 13, 40,000 prepared for war crossed over of about 80,000 that were there. So here these tribes are faithfully doing what they were told to do. And indeed it worked. And people feared Joshua uh, all the days of his life. So uh, as, as we mentioned before, Okay, Joshua is exalted and feared, and, and God exalted Moses. But did they always respect him? And we showed some evidence. No, they didn't. And uh, Joshua seems to have had less uh, open rebellion uh, than, than Moses had to deal with uh, as he is working to, uh, to lead the people. Verses 15 through 18, the priests can come out of the river now. Uh, all the people have crossed over, and uh, they can uh, they can come out. They bring the Ark of the Covenant out, and as soon as their feet touched what was dry land, the waters returned to their place and overflowed the banks like they did before. So a very clear beginning, a clear end to this miracle uh, that we see here. And that's typical of miracles. I mean, they are so absolutely definitive that the laws of nature uh, are suspended. That That is uh, what a miracle is. You know, some people talk about like the miracle of childbirth. Well, childbirth is a natural, it's spectacular, absolutely. Very significant, but it's not a miracle. It's part of the natural process. Uh Putting your foot in the water and a flooding river stopping, taking your foot out of the water and the floods come back, that's not natural. That is a miracle. Uh, so we have that happening uh, completely. And then we have a, another recitation more uh, restating what had happened. And they go to Gilgal. We had the Acacia Grove on the other side of the Jordan, and here they set up camp in Gilgal. That would have been uh, about two kilometers from Jericho, uh, close enough that they could see it, uh, but there is still uh, a distance away. So we get into chapter five, and we have the purification, the Passover, and the provision. <clears throat> So it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan, all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over, that their heart melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. So the, the news of this got out. And when, when you have uh, a flood, you know, a river in its flood stage, that would be a, generally a barrier, and, and the people would be expecting, okay, there's no way the Israelites could cross over uh, because the floods are, and, and that's kind of protecting us. Well, here, miraculously, this area we thought was protected, suddenly uh, we have these this Israelite army right there on our doorstep. And if we look at uh, at if we were to look at the map here, where Jericho is, is right in the middle. So they've crossed the Jordan, and they're in the middle of the land. There's tribes and, and nations to the north, tribes and nations to the south, all the way from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, what they're going to do is cut through the middle, separate the north from the south, and then... After they've divided, conquer one, then conquer the other. Uh, that's the plan we have here. Uh, and here, the, the Amorites and the Canaanites are given. Uh, those are not uh, technically specific, but that's uh, a way of describing all the people of the land. You know, we have the, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the whole, all these different groups um, 
you know, back in Genesis 15, God just said, ups, we'll call them the, uh, the Amorites. And here, call them the Amorites and the Canaanites. But he's talking about all the nations here. So they had heard what happened, and uh, they were afraid because of this great miracle uh, that had occurred. And suddenly, there was a uh, potential war upon them. Verses 2 through 9, what we have here uh, is the Lord, uh, Lord tells Joshua, okay, now it's time to circumcise all the men. And this had not been done uh, during their wilderness wanderings. We learned that from verse number five, where all the people who came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. So, okay, we got to take care of this. Uh, and that was started uh, back in Genesis 17 for Abraham and all his descendants. Uh, so we have that command that they hadn't uh, hadn't done while they're in the wilderness. Now they're going to take care of it. Um, and then... Uh, Here in verse number nine, the Lord said to Joshua, this day I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Uh, the Egyptians wouldn't let the Israelites circumcise. Uh, so that's a commandment that they were not allowed to, uh, to obey. Uh, so here we have total compliance uh, as God had commanded. Therefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal, which means the rolling, uh, rolled away the reproach. That's how Gilgal got its name. So uh, the Israelites are there, and it's going to take them a little time uh, to recover from that, uh, from the circumcisions that these men have undergone. Verse number 10. Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. Uh, so they hadn't been celebrating the Passover while they're in the wilderness. So we see the pattern here. Okay, you're in the land. Time to get busy and do these things that God had commanded you to do. Uh, and, and the Passover, you know, that was looking back to uh, that 10th plague. Symbolic of God passing over the people uh, for destruction, allowing them to enter uh, into the promise of rest. And that first promise was to be out of slavery. Here we have symbolically the beginning of the Passover again, that they're celebrating it. They're able to enter into, enter into their promised rest, the land of Canaan. And Jesus was also crucified on the Passover, through which we can enter into our rest, which is heaven. So we see that symbol symbolism uh, happening right on through. And the Hebrew writer, uh, chapter 3, verse 7, to chapter 4, verse 10, you could even carry that on to verse 14, makes that application for us uh, and, and connects those dots for us. Verses 11 and 12. The manna disappears. They've had that throughout the wilderness wanderings. Uh, every morning there was man, a manna there uh, since Exodus chapter 16. But now, after they celebrated the Passover, the manna stopped. And they were eating the produce of the land. The abundance of the land was so sufficient that it could sustain them. Uh, and and that could be their their source of food. So we have that uh, that sufficiency there. Then we get to one of my favorite passages uh, here at the end of chapter five, starting in verse thirteen. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold. A man stood opposite him 
with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, No, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. So we have this appearance of somebody who looks to be a man with his sword drawn, ready for battle. And Joshua doesn't recognize him and questions him. Hey, are you here to help us or are you for the other guys? And that, uh, that person there identifies himself as the commander of the army of the Lord. I have now come. How reassuring that would have to be for him. That, yes, indeed, all this time, we have the Israelites doing, uh, uh, being led by God, the, the pillar of fire by night, the cloud by day. And here they cross over, and we have the commander of the army of the Lord. Special provision made for battle. And we go back to the promises that were made by God to Joshua that we talked about earlier this evening. Be strong and courageous. You do not yet realize, Joshua, everything I have. And it kind of reminds me of uh, 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 14 through 17, um, where Elisha is there with his servant. Uh, go ahead and flip in your Bibles over there. I think that helps us to understand uh, a little bit better. And what we have here in 2 Kings 6, uh, the Syrians are upset with Elisha, and they're coming after him. Uh, therefore, the king of the Syrians sent horses and chariots and a great army there, that they and they came by night and surrounded the city where Elisha was. And when the servant of the man of God, that's Elisha's servant, arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, that would be Elisha, Do not fear, for those who are with, who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So here we have a, a vision of uh there was more protection for Elisha than that servant knew. There is more going into battle on behalf of Joshua and the Israelites than just the Israelites. This is the Lord's battle. He's going to take care of things. Uh, and we have this, this sighting of the commander of the army of the Lord. Uh, yes, indeed, this is taken care of. Who is this commander? Well, notice what we saw here. Joshua's response uh, to seeing the commander. Verse 14, he fell on his face and he worshiped. Well, Matthew 4.10 says, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Revelation 19.10, John attempted to worship an angel 
And he was told, do not do that. Again, chapter 22, verses 8 and 9. No, you are to worship only God. That is the requirement. And because Jesus quoted Old Testament in, in Matthew 4, verse 10, we know that that was, has always been the case. That they were always to worship only God. So since Joshua offered worship to this being, who does this being have to be? Has to be God. Um, and and I would argue that this would be the second person of the Godhead, the Logos, the pre-incarnate Christ who is there. Who identifies himself as he was that pillar of fire. He was personally leading the people in the pillar of fire. Here's another form that he's taken. Again, leading uh, the army of the Lord. And Joshua understands uh, in his response to him there at the end of verse 14, what does my Lord say to his servant? So Joshua knew he was in a subordinate role to the commander of the armies of the Lord. So this is somebody who is clearly uh, outranks Joshua, who's the general of the army. Um, and this is what uh, theologians would call a theophany, uh, an appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, theos, theos is a Greek word meaning uh, God, so God's presence. And we see that in Genesis 16. Uh, referred to as the angel of the Lord, came to Hagar. Chapter 18, as God was explaining to uh, uh, to Abram about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, there, angel, he also calls him uh, Jehovah. So he's given both names there in, in chapter 20, uh, excuse me, chapter 18. Genesis 22, uh, who stopped uh, Abraham from sac sacrificing Isaac? Angel of the Lord. Exodus 3, there at the Moses, Moses at the burning bush, the angel of the Lord was in the bush. And we see a lot of similarities, the holy ground statement, similar to what we have here. And I think that was a trigger to help Joshua know exactly who he was talking to. We also see them in Numbers and show up in Judges. So, uh, and there's some cases where you have uh, what would be called the uh, the angel of the Lord or an angel of the Lord, uh, and making those distinctions sometimes it's uh, uh, it can be difficult to do. Uh, but as as we look here, I mean, this is uh, uh, clearly a message to Joshua that there is more going into battle than just these people that you have here uh and this will this will be uh a supplement to what you've already seen but who is in charge the lord is completely and totally well i hope uh hope that helps i know we had to uh kind of pick up the pace a little bit uh as we prepare for um uh, Quiz next time, be strong and of good courage. And who was called the servant of the Lord more than anyone else? That would be Moses. A little explanation about uh, Rahab and her being praised in Hebrews chapter 11. Then we'll talk about... Uh, how do we know that crossing the Jordan was a miracle? How did they know that the Lord was the Lord over all the earth? And then we'll look at three elements in chapter five. Final preparations. The purification, the Passover, and the commander of the army of the Lord.
I know we're uh, we're out of time. Does anybody have any questions before we finish up? Brother Tisky, I would uh, I will elaborate on something that I uh, observed when you mm -hmm. mentioned about uh, Rayab and the uh, you know the fact that uh, some some people think that the spies uh, you know took advantage of her because uh, the word Allah is mentioned. But um, I think we, we must be really careful when we make our own judgment or jump to conclusions because now we're basically adding things uh, to God's word where it is silent. So um, I would always go to Second Peter 2, verse 16. Yeah, where it says, as also in all his apostles speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are um, let me see here, it's uh, okay they that is that was no that they that are unlearned and unstable the rest as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction so that is something that we must be very careful of if we look at scripture and just add things uh, to where the bible hasn't even mentioned anything about that so that's uh, my contribution tonight absolutely and and i would uh would echo the fact that when we look at that list of people who are praised there in Hebrews 11, not a single one of them was perfect. They all had done something that was sinful in their lives. Uh, so we need to remember that as well. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your patience. And uh, let's close up with a word of prayer. Our God and Father in heaven above, we thank you for this day, for the time we've had to study your word. We pray that you would be with us as we strive to get to know you better. Father, we pray that you would uh, bless each of us as we go about our uh, activities going into the weekend. Keep us safe. Bring us back at the appointed time Monday, if it be your will. Be with those who were mentioned earlier, those who are suffering uh, in different ways. Bless them in the ways that uh, they need. Keep us safe during this night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.